and welcome to today's concert. And today we're in Denmark, in Olensa, in the concert hall. Tom's here, my brother, filming and recording once again. And I'm here to do a concert for the Olensa International Organ Festival. So I thought while we're here, I'll bring you a concert from this organ, some other pieces, just to show this wonderful instrument. Now, as many of you will know, I do a lot of my concerts at the Bridgewater Hall in Manchester, which has a Markerson, a Danish instrument. This is one of its cousins. This is a Markerson organ from 1982 and another concert hall instrument. More Danish in style, some neo -Baroque rock elements but a very very exciting concert instrument so I thought I'd bring some pieces from here and since we're in Carl Nielsen concert hall what better way to begin than with a piece of Carl Nielsen probably the most famous Danish composer and the best known Nielsen was born here and uh, wrote many pieces for symphony orchestra, huge symphonies, concertos and of course theatrical production music. And that was a piece from one of those theatrical productions. It was the Oriental March from Aladdin. And with this sort of very uh, fairy tale theme of the Thousand and One Nights, we'll be staying with that a bit later on since Olenza is also the birthplace of Hans Christian Andersen. And even today, Tom and I both made a visit to his birth home just round the corner from the concert hall. But we're going to say, first of all, with another composer who was actually born in Denmark, Dietrich Buxtehude, known as being German. He recognised his Danish roots all his life. Um, he spent most of his life in Lübeck at the Marienkirche, the St. Mary's Church in Lübeck, where he was very influential over a lot of composers in the Baroque period in the sort of late 1600s, early 1700s, including people like Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, Buxtehude is very interesting because he used to spread his sort of knowledge of music, not through teaching and theory, but through the writing of music and performance, really. His pieces are sort of known as in the North German tradition of these sort of multi-sectional uh, preludes, fantasias and toccatas. And I'm going to play you one now, the Preludium in F sharp minor. It's an unusual piece because in Buxtehude's day it wouldn't really have been possible on the organs he played because of the tuning. It uses a lot of the black notes and is very chromatic. It's thought that because Buxtehude was a friend of Werkmeister who had invented new tunings for organs and instruments, he was experimenting with tunings and would often tune his own instruments instruments to use for his own pieces. So we're not entirely sure what the tuning would be. We have equal temperament today. It's a very sort of virtuosic piece in many ways for that time. Multisectional, as I say, so it begins with a bit of a fantasia opening, um, a sort of chordal section, a couple of fugal sections, so on. And these pieces just build up. And so they're not preludes and fugues in the form that we sort of know, but these sort of free form fantasias, a preludium as they're known. Um, very exciting piece and shows this organ wonderfully. So this is the Preludium in F sharp minor by Dietrich Buxtehude.
Very sort of different music, especially for that time. It uses the whole organ really well and the whole of the pedals. You see there's lots of pedal solos in those style of music. Um, I'm going to go back to the Hans Christian Andersen route now. As I said, he was born just across the road from this concert hall and famous for all his amazing fairy tales. You just have to think of what, The Little Mermaid, The Emperor's New Clothes, Thumbelina, and of course, The Little Match Girl. And we're going to play a piece from that now. Um, it's a, a piece by August Enner, another Danish composer, um, who wrote an overture, The Little Match Girl, and it basically follows the tale of the fairy tale um, in a sort of musical form. The Little Match Girl, of course, is set around Christmas time. She goes out to sell her matches, and she daren't go home without selling them all. Um, she's so cold, though, that she starts to light the matches to keep herself warm. And she's obviously completely delirious with the cold, really, because in the matches she sees visions of things Things. She sees a family home at Christmas with all the, the warm Christmas meal and the Christmas tree. And then she lights another one and sees her grandma, the person who really loved her and she misses the most. Um, she's heartbroken at this and she lights the whole bundle of matches to keep herself warm and to also keep the image of her grandma alive. And when they've completely burnt down, she's there dead in the snow and passers-by find her um, and they're absolutely horrified at finding this child dead in the snow but they don't know that actually with the last matches she went and joined her grandma in heaven and she's happy at last um, an absolutely tragic but beautiful tale and uh, Hans Christian Andersen was very very musical he knew people like Liszt and as a child he sang they called him the nightingale uh, little nightingale and um, he said when words fail music speaks and so I'll stop using words now and let the music speak this is a wonderful wonderful beautiful piece by August Enner the overture to the little match girl
hope you enjoyed hearing that. It's a, a piece I didn't know. Tom suggested it, and I quickly wrote it out on a, a sheet of manuscript paper just the other day. Um, but I thought it's such a beautiful piece of music, and so sort of warm with the little match girl being so happy at the end of the tale. And the sounds of this organ are sort of really, really beautiful. You wouldn't expect it from this style of instrument, but some really sort of very orchestral, lovely sounds. Um, as I said, uh, we already had some books to hood as an influence on Bach, so why not include a piece of Bach? It suits this organ beautifully. Uh, and one of the trio sonatas. Now, Bach was famous when he, in his 20s when he was organist Arnstadt. Um, he asked for four weeks off work so he could walk all the way to Lübeck, some 400 kilometres, to hear Buxtehude, see him and learn things about playing and music in general. Four weeks, I suppose, is quite a long time. It was, uh, he was supposed to be back by December because, of course, Christmas would be quite an essential time for any organist to be at work. He unfortunately stayed away about four times as long as that and didn't arrive till well into the new year. And of course, the church authorities weren't too happy. And when asked why he was away so long, he said he'd been pondering one or two things about his art. Um, not an excuse that would probably stand up to the boss nowadays, but he obviously learnt quite a lot and admired Buxtehude a huge amount. I'm going to play you one of the trio sonatas, the second trio sonata, show you the, the chamber sounds of this instrument. Even though it looks quite modern and there's not that many pipes on display, there's a huge amount inside, um, it shows the divisions of the organ really well because it is laid out in uh, different sections inside. There's a positive above my head, a swell there, pedal on either side and a grate above. So it's very much of the style of back was with a modern twist. These trios, of course, show the player and the instrument in equal measure. Some beautiful moments of articulation and sounds and use both hands and feet completely independently. This one, number two in C minor, is a really wonderful sort of chamber piece. It could be a flute sonata for two flutes and harpsichord or something like that. It's very light, very beautiful. Um, showing the little chamber sounds, as I said. Hope you enjoy this. It's in three movements, a quick movement, a slow, beautiful linked movement into the third movement, and then an, uh, another allegro final movement. This is the trio sonata number two by Johann Sebastian Bach.
an amazing piece and uh, it's sort of a real challenge sort of physically for the hands and the feet going across the whole of the keyboards and the pedal board but a brilliant effect of music at the same time. Now as I said I'm here in Alenso to play for the International Organ Festival and one of the pieces I'm including is the Elgar Organ Sonata so I thought I'd play you the first movement now. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece of English music, written in 1895. It was supposed to be a request by Hugh Blair, the new organist of Worcester Cathedral, for a voluntary from Elgar. Um, he was meant to be playing the newly finished organ, or was to be finished organ, of Worcester Cathedral for a group of visiting organists. He asked Elgar for this voluntary, and Elgar being sometimes, he, he had a tendency sometimes to procrastinate and not quite finish pieces in time and sometimes he got carried away and this is no exception. Some four or five days before the performance was due, Hugh Blair asked him how it was getting on so three days before the performance he gave him a manuscript of his new piece for him to play. It was a some 30 minute piece, a, a sonata in a symphonic scale Four movements all together and a huge, huge piece of music. Really, really difficult. One of sort of the pinnacles of the organ repertoire at the time, really. Uh, and very challenging because of the huge stretches and the use of the whole instrument. Of course, Hugh Blair was uh, a bit challenged by this, unfortunately, as any organist would be. And he famously was the first person to make um, a slight mess of the Elgar organ sonata, I think it's fair to say. I'm sure he did a brilliant job, really, with the time he had, just three days. Um, I've spent at least four days on it. So hopefully it should be okay. Uh, but I'm going to give you the first movement, a, a brilliant grand piece in, as you would expect, Elgarian, Victorian style at its greatest. It sounds completely orchestral when you hear this piece, and I've played it many, many times on big English organs. However, it was supposed to be for a new organ at Worcester, a Hope Jones instrument, which wouldn't have been a, a typical English organ if it was finished at the time of the first performance. So I thought a Danish instrument would be an interesting thing to hear it on, and that's why I've been asked to come and play it here um, in the concert. It shows sort of a great deal of uh, clarity in a way that we don't always get in English organs. So hopefully it will show some of the beautiful solo sounds, the full chorus of this instrument, which projects amazingly into this hall. So I hope you enjoy this. This is the first movement, the Allegro Maestoso, from Elgar's Organ Sonata.
a great grand piece of organ music and an unmistakably Elgar. If it had been written for the orchestra, I think it would be even better known rather than just as an organ piece. There's so many sort of really beautiful orchestral melodies and moments within that piece. We've reached the end of the concert and uh, I just want to say thank you for watching. Thank you to Tom for filming and recording and bringing you hopefully scenes of Olenza and also the wonderful concert hall here and this amazing organ and it's great, great sound. Thank you to everyone at the concert hall who've been so enthusiastic and let us film today and of course everyone at the Organ Festival, especially the director, Tina Christiansen, uh, which has been so helpful and so great at promoting music with this wonderful festival. The programme I'm playing is an English one uh, and we're actually ending with pomp and circumstance with a full choir and all audience singing very sort of uh, prom style. So it's wonderful to bring that here and uh, share this wonderful instrument. And to finish with, I thought we'd go back to the Hans Christian Andersen theme really with uh, a link to his uh, story, The Steadfast Tin Soldier. I'm going to play you Parade of the Tin Soldiers by uh, Leon Jessel. Um, Written originally as a piano piece, an orchestral piece. It's been arranged from military bands and used in theatre productions and in cartoons and animations countless times. You'll probably know it. I've never played it on the organ, though, so this is really a first. Quite comical in places, and I've tried to find some comical sounds where I can on the instrument. And right at the very end, you'll notice they all fall over. I hope you enjoyed the concert today. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy Leon Jessel's The Parade of the Tin Soldiers. <laughs>